I know we're facing a huge crisis of health, a huge crisis of economics, personal crisis of, you know, depression and anxiety, frustration and fear, family crisis, been, been locked up too long, too tight, <laughs> educational crisis, will school open, when will they open, will it be live, will it be on video, how will we, you know, it's, it's all over the place. The leaders are confused, we're confused, confusion is confused, okay? But I would like to suggest to you from a very famous passage of scripture, you can quote it, that your God and my God, our God, is more than enough. I want to take your attention to Psalm 23. I know you know it, but walk with me through it one more time. David, the author of this psalm, summarizes the psalm in verse 1. Verses 2 through 6 is merely the exposition of verse 1. If you get verse 1, you really have the whole psalm. He just breaks it down in 2 through 6. He says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Translation, He's more than enough. The word Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, Jehovah, Yahweh, is God's covenantal name. It's his name of relationship. So he's not just talking about God generic. He's talking about God who is the Lord. Remember when God created Adam, he no longer just used the name Elohim. He used the name Yahweh Elohim, the Lord God beginning in chapter 2, verse 4 of Genesis, to show that he's not just the powerful creator, he's the powerful creator who wants to relate to mankind who he created. So what David is saying is my relationship with God, not just my belief in the existence of God. The Lord is my shepherd. Now David's old occupation used to be a shepherd. As a young man, he was a, a sheep herder. He knew what sheep were like, and he knew they needed a shepherd. To appreciate the psalm, you've got to appreciate sheep, <laughs> because he claims, based on his being a shepherd, that God is to him what he was to his sheep. Let me tell you something about sheep. Sheep are dumb. <laughs> uh, by the way, that's why the Bible says all we like sheep have gone astray, because we are dumb. Let me tell you how dumb sheep are. I was told by one sheep herder that sheep are so dumb that one sheep will start walking around in a circle. When other sheep see it walking around in a circle, they will follow it until there's a circle of sheep following the one sheep that doesn't know where it's going, and they think they're going somewhere simply because they're going behind another sheep. And all they're doing is going in circles. That's, did I tell you? Sheep are dumb, okay. Not only are sheep dumb, they are defenseless. They are defenseless. They are easy prey for the enemy. The foxes, the coyotes, the hyenas, they are defenseless. They're also dirty. Sheep are dirty. You see that white wool get dirty real quick. Sheep can get really dirty and so can God's people. We've all had those times in our lives when we needed to clean up, we needed to clean off because things had gotten dirty. And finally, sheep are dependent. Without a shepherd, they lost as a jaybird. They need direction. Uh, they, they're kind of hard to train. You've never seen in the circus a sheep trainer, right? You've never seen a, a, a trainer telling sheep to roll over or to pop up. Because they're not, they're, not, they're not good for much unless the shepherd is calling the shots. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. And since sheep are dumb, the Lord is the one who makes me intelligent. Since sheep are dirty, the Lord is the one who cleans me up. Since sheep are dirty, the Lord is the one who defends me. Since sheep are dirty, it is the Lord that I'm depending on. 
He says, the Lord is my shepherd. I'm just a dumb sheep. And because the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In other words, I won't go lacking. He is my sufficiency. My argument today, in the midst of all we're going through, is that you and I need a shepherd because we don't have answers to our own, our own mess, our own struggles, and then the world doesn't have answers, says the Lord, who I am in relationship with, Jehovah, he's my shepherd. He's the one I'm looking to to address these issues in my life. He's more than enough because he covers all the bases. Verses two through six is his exposition of verse one. He says, first of all, if the Lord is your shepherd, he will meet your spiritual needs. He says, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. The first line of verse three summarizes it. He gives me back. He restores my soul. He's speaking about his spiritual needs. His soul needs reviving. His soul needs some get up and go because it's gotten up and gone. He's discouraged the soul sometime. Soul pain. That's, that's deeper than body pain. That's where something is wrong with your life. That, that your soul is your life. Something is wrong. Life is not working out. And he says, if the Lord is your shepherd, he says he makes me lie down. Because you know, we can be a little rebellious. And sometimes he has to make us lie down. He has to put us flat on our backs. You know, if you're a parent, you've had to make your kids lie down. They fighting it. They, they, I'm not tired. I'm not tired. Are well, you going to bed now? Because you're making them to lie down. Sometimes doctors make us lie down. When I was, over the last couple of months, going through a battle with pneumonia, they told me to no, you can't, you can't do what you normally do. You have to lie down. You've got something going on inside of you that needs to be rectified, and it won't get rectified if you keep moving. So they forced me, they made me lie down. He says he makes me lie down. When God puts you and us, and right now he's made the whole nation kind of lie down, he says, when God makes you lie down, it's to restore your soul. It's to give you your life back because life gets draining. Hurt, pain, rejection, relationships, economics. It just sucks the life out of you. Being quarantined, being afraid when you go out, having to wear a mask, risking not wearing one. Just, it just... It just comes in every single direction. Ah, so he, 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 he makes you settle down. He puts you and us and yeah, the world in a situation of refocusing. The key words is that he leads me beside quiet waters. He makes me lie down in green pastures. The key words is green, are green and quiet. The pastures are green, which means they're soft because there's a lot of grass there if it's green. He makes me lie down, but he cushions me when I lie down. This is not, green. This is not grass for eating. This is grass for, for a, a mattress. <laughs> this is a mattress cover. He makes me lie down. He puts me in a situation where I've got to refocus spiritually. Many times we don't see when God puts us in situations that we can't fix, he's calling for a divine focus. That's why during this time when you don't have to go to work and you've got some time that you didn't normally have uh, with the hectic pace of how life used to be, he's making me and you lie down. Still waters, not moving waters, still waters. You've seen pictures of a shepherd leading his sheep beside Still waters, there's, there's the sun sets in the background, the water is glassy, calm, and the sheep are walking by. It's a relaxed atmosphere. Let me tell you something about sheep. Sheep are not that sure-footed. 
And when the water is rough, if you get them too close to it, they'll get scared. Because you see, if a sheep falls in water and that wool gets wet, it'll pull them down. They'll drown. You know, life can cause us to slip, trip, and wants to suck us under the circumstances. You may be underneath the circumstances right now. But he says he restores my soul. You're, you know, ever, all of us have phones now that uh, are pretty sophisticated, but they still run out of juice, don't they? And the power needs to be restored, so you take it back. And what do you do? You put it on the base and you let it rest there. You let it rest there because what it needs is to be restored. The power needs to be reintroduced because the use has worn it down. Living can wear you down. Life can wear you down. But if the Lord is your shepherd, he restores your soul. He meets you in that place of recovery. That is, if he can get you to lie down, if he can get you to chill for a moment, if he can get you to rest. He goes on to say, if the Lord is your shepherd, he'll meet your directional need. The second half of verse 3. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. The paths of rightness, he tells me which way to go. Not only does he meet your spiritual need, he meets your directional need. That is, he guides you. That is, if he's your shepherd. God's got a GPS system you won't believe. How would we make, how did we make it without the, without the GPS system? And we didn't know where we were going. We either needed to be writing it down or somebody telling us, you know, we had to, we had to go through conniptions to make sure we got there. You know what the beauty of the GPS system is? It not only guides you, it corrects you if you make a wrong turn. I remember driving one day and I missed the exit, not paying attention, and it recalibrated. It popped off, recalibrated, and reversed my direction. Because don't we do that sometimes? Miss God. Miss doing right. Miss obedience. And we got to be recalibrated and brought back. He says he leads me on the paths that are right. That's why he's got to be your personal shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I know he's everybody's shepherd who's a believer, but he's talking about a, a monogram shepherd. You say, I got a shirt on, and this particular shirt has a monogram on it. It's got T and E, standing for Tony Evans. Now, there are plenty of shirts, but this is my shirt because it's got my monogram on it. You see, God just doesn't want to be a savior. He wants to be your savior. And more importantly, your shepherd. He wants to be the one directing and guiding your life. And so he wants a monogram relationship with you, not just a general go to church relationship with you. He wants to be your shepherd. I remember one day I was at the airport, crowded airport, and there was a change of plans. And uh, they were, they were, making all these changes and I was unaware of all the changes they were making that was going to affect my journey. Thousands of people were at the airport and that's when I heard a cry that said, Dr. Tony Evans, will you go to the red courtesy phone? I went to the red courtesy phone, picked it up and it was my assistant, Sylvia. And she said to me, they're making changes and I thought you may not know about it and let me tell you what they are. Left to my own ideas, I was confused. But somehow she tracked me down. There were thousands of people there, but she found me by my name and gave me directions on where I should go. You see, he knows your name. He knows where you ought to go. He knows the confusion why you haven't gotten there yet, whether it's your fault or somebody else's fault. And he knows how to reverse it and get you back on track if he is your shepherd. See, our problem is too many of us are getting our directions from the wrong GPSs, the secular culture, the world, our friends, ourselves, the media. 
and we have created chaos. But he says, if the Lord is your shepherd, he will meet your directional needs. He goes on next and says, if the Lord is your shepherd, he will meet your emotional needs. He says in verse 4, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Emotion, he says, I will fear no evil. Let me tell you about the valley of the shadow, as far as a sheep is concerned, because he's talking about a shepherd. The valley of the shadow is a valley between two mountains in Israel. And when the sheep is coming upon a valley, when the sun is setting, it casts a shadow over the valley because of the blockage of the, of the mountains. So the shadow is cast over the valley. Now you have to understand, sheep are dumb. So it can be six o'clock in the evening, but they're so dumb, they think it's nighttime when it's only a shadow. And so they get afraid of the shadow thinking it's night because the mountains have blocked the direct ray of the sun. Perhaps you right now are going through a valley, a dark place. I know what that feels like. Perhaps right now you're going through a place of loss, a place of anguish. Perhaps you're scared. He says, when things look like death, <laughs> that is, they're casting an emotional instability in your life. He says, what I want you to remember is that he can meet you there and he can calm your fears. We fear the past because of its impact on us. We fear the present, what we're going through right now, and we fear the uncertainty of the future. We fear death, we fear catching this virus, sickness. We fear for our family. And none of it may have happened yet, but it's a shadow. And the S-O-N has been blocked. Our emotions have taken over. And let's, let's, come on, let's don't be super spiritual. Sometimes you can't help how you feel. You may not even want to feel it, but you feel it. And to deny it is a lie. So if you're afraid and you deny you're afraid, you lied, which means you just sinned. No, no, if that's how you feel, that's how you feel. That's real. But what he does do is he makes a decision in the midst of his emotions. That you can control. You can't always tell your emotions to disappear. What you can do is shift your focus while you're working through your emotions. He says, I'm in this, this shadowy place of uncertainty, of insecurity, but thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. He, he shifts his focus without denying his reality. It is a shadowy time. A father took his son to the zoo one day, and when he took his son to the zoo, they went to the lion cage. The lion saw the little boy close to the cage and came up to the cage and roared, Rawr! Rawr! Terrified the little boy. The little boy called to his father, who was just standing a few feet back, Daddy! Daddy! The lion! Father said, Boy, that lion's not going to bother you. He said, Daddy! 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 The lion! The lion is roaring the lion, and he was terrified. The father said, son, that lion is not going to bother you. The boy said, daddy, daddy, don't you see the lion? That's when the little boy, that's when the daddy said to the little boy, uh, I see the lion, but I'm staring at the cage. Yeah, you may see the shadow, but what are you staring at? Are you staring at the sufficiency of your God and your shepherd? Or are you staring at the shadow of the lion's roar? I know he's loud. I know he's intimidating. I know he produces fear. But he says, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. God's rod is his, the shepherd's club. That's where he would beat off 
anything that would come after the sheep, the staff, the stick with the hook on it. That's where he would establish his authority and his deliverance. That would be his grace because when a sheep got caught in the thicket, he would reach in with the staff and wiggle it out because it was caught. Maybe, maybe something is overpowering you and you need the power of God's rod. Or maybe you're stuck in a situation and maybe you went into the wrong place at the wrong time and did the wrong thing and your wool is stuck. And you need his grace to reach in and wiggle you out. You're afraid of the consequences. You're afraid of what's going to happen, but you want to be set free. He says, thy rod and thy staff, they, they calm me down in my, in my fear. Oh, yes. He's got two things. He's right in his left hand, rod and staff. He, power and grace. And they will, they will keep you calm in a storm. It won't keep you out of a storm, but it'll weather you through it as you submit to your great shepherd. Let's review where we've been so far. The Lord wants to be your shepherd personally, my shepherd. And if he's your shepherd, he'll meet you in your spiritual need. He'll restore your soul. He'll give you back your life. Your directional need. He'll, he'll guide you in the way you ought to go and reverse directions as needed when you are willing to abide by his GPS signals. And then he'll meet your emotional needs. When circumstances, viruses, situations cause you dismay, he will meet you and calm you down. No matter how deep that valley is, how long it's been there, one man said, I have so much to worry about. If I get anything else, it's going to take me two weeks to get around to it because sometimes things come just one after another, don't they? He's there to meet you there. Then he says, if the Lord is your shepherd, in verse 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You've anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. If the Lord is your shepherd, he'll meet your spiritual need, your directional need, your emotional need. Now, he will meet your physical need. He says, he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. In other words, he's meeting my needs in a pandemic. God has a way all through scripture of meeting needs, of hitting bullseyes with a crooked stick. He has a way of being able to feed you when the business is shut down, to provide for you with laws that say nobody can has to be forced to pay rent right now. Maybe it's a stimulus check that comes that you didn't plan for when you first entered the pandemic. I, I don't know how God's going to do it in your particular situation. All I know is what David said, if the Lord is your shepherd, he can prepare a table. Now, what a shepherd would do is he would walk around with a pouch in biblical days, and he'd have a cloth and some fodder. He'd spread the cloth out on the ground when he found the lost sheep, like a tablecloth, reach in his pouch and put some fodder down so that the sheep could eat that had gotten lost and was now hungry. Now the thing is that surrounding the sheep are all these enemies of the sheep, foxes, hyenas, coyotes, who want to eat the sheep. Not only could they not eat the sheep, they could not eat what the sheep was eating because the shepherd was covering the sheep. In the presence of the enemies of the sheep, he still got to die. See, this is why the Lord needs to be my shepherd and your shepherd, because my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their seed begging bread. He knows how to meet you, meet us in our physical needs. He says, he says, you anoint my head with oil. When a sheep got lost and got caught in the thicket, it would cut itself on the, on the vines. Because one of the things that would, would create this cutting is them going after berries and things that had, that, that had thorns on them. And sometimes they would get cut. The shepherd would come and anoint the head with oil that is soothed, 
the situation, soothe the pain. Ah, this can be painful. Life hurts. You live long enough and your heart bleeds. But he knows how to, at the right time, give you the right phone call, the right encouraging word, the right song or the right sermon, the right reinforcement to anoint your head with oil, to soothe you in the midst of your circumstance. He says, my cup overflows. See, on his pouch, he'd have a cup too. He'd dip the cup in water and bring it over to the sheep that had gotten lost, and as he walked, the water would flop over the full cup. The sheep would see that the cup overflows. You know what that meant? It meant that the sheep would have more than enough. More than enough. Oh, Paul put it this way, didn't he? Now unto him who can do exceedingly abundantly above all you can ask or think. He can overflow. He can, you know, the old folks used to say, he's been better to me than I've been to myself. Oh yeah, he can overflow it. Even in the presence of your enemies. This overflow of a cup in the scripture is joy. He can give you joy in the middle of your junk. When he is your shepherd, he can overflow your cup. Finally, he says, surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. If the Lord is your shepherd, he'll meet your spiritual need, your directional need, your emotional need, your physical need, and now he says he'll meet your eternal need. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. It's like two sheepdogs. You've seen sheepdogs, right? Because we talk about shepherds, sheep, sheepdogs. One dog is named goodness, one dog is named mercy. And uh, they will follow me. The Hebrew word here is to pursue. It's like dogs nipping at your back and you running forward. God's not going to let you outrun his goodness and he's not going to let you outrun his mercy. They're going to snip at you. They're going to oh, nip at you because he wants to keep you going forward. He doesn't want you retreating, quitting, throwing in the towel, running away. He wants you to be pursued by his goodness. Oh, it's not just a slogan to say God is good all the time and all the time God is good. No, that's not just a slogan. That's a reality. Look for the goodness of God even in the pain of life. Look for the loving kindness, his faithful mercy, even during times of difficulty. And he says, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I want to live in his presence. So that, that's what this is about. In time and on to eternity. Because eternity is merely the continuation of time without time being an issue. Because if you love Jesus Christ, if you're born again, you don't die, you transition into eternity. With this perspective of life, don't you get it? He's more than enough. So there are two questions that have to be answered as we close. The first question is, is the Lord your Savior? Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal sin bearer? The Bible makes it clear that you must come to Christ for the forgiveness of sins and the free gift of eternal life that he offers to everyone who comes by faith to him to receive it. He cannot be your shepherd if you won't allow him to be your savior. And that's simply going to Christ and saying, I believe that you are the son of God who died on the cross for me. It's got to be personal. You rose from the dead for me. And I'm now placing my life into your hands for my eternal destiny and for my forgiveness. I'm trusting you alone. For my salvation. I'm not going to try to earn it. Can't work for it. Can't be baptized to get it. Can't buy it. But he will give it away if you trust him to receive it. Once you come to Christ for your salvation, 
Now you can follow Christ as your shepherd. See, he says the Lord is my shepherd because he was already his savior. But the Lord is the one who's guiding him and governing him, leading him and directing him. The Lord is the one who he's looking to for his spiritual restoration, directional guidance, emotional stability, physical provision, and eternal hope. You see? Now, there is nothing that you're going through that doesn't fit in one of those categories. You can't name one item in your life that doesn't fit in Psalm 23. Because all I'm trying to say today is if the Lord is your shepherd, he's more than enough. He's more than sufficient. You know, it's hard to find full service stations anymore, isn't it? Everything is self-service, self-service, self-service. You got to get out and pump your own gas, right? But when we were growing up, everything was full service. You pulled up, they filled your car up, they pulled up the hood, checked your oil, they washed your windshield, checked your tires, because they were full service. We live in a self-service world when we have a full service God. So where you want to Park your life at your own self-service, you taking care of all of those categories, or before a full-service God who says, if you let me shepherd you, that is, follow me, my will, my way, for my glory, when you surrender your life daily to me, I'll be your shepherd. And when I'm your shepherd, you'll discover I'm more than enough. God bless you. One of the dominant questions of today can be recited simply by asking, Adam, where you at? The missing man has become the crisis of the day. Not the missing male, the missing man. It is the question of the single woman who can't find a worthwhile man to marry. It's the question of the single parent who's been abandoned by the father of her children. And she wants to know, Adam, where you at? It's that child who has to grow up with a physically or emotionally absent father. And he's asking the question, however he phrases it, Adam, where you at? It's the question of churches and pastors who have to keep calling on ladies to do jobs that men ought to do because the men are missing in action. And the question is, Adam, where you at? As I stood in a prison a couple of months ago speaking to a group of prisoners in the male jail, and I asked them, all of you who grew up without a father in your life raised your hand and 90% of the hands went up. So as I looked at them, I wondered, Adam, where you at? I was talking to this week a teacher in one of our public schools and he told me, I'm resigning this year. I can't take it anymore. He was talking about the rebellion, the end of subordination, the lack of respect coming from the students in his classroom. And the question is, Adam, where you at? Because they didn't have a father. And so the question on the floor is, Adam, where you at? We're living in a day of terrorism where violence due to the absence of the conscience and the dumbing down of decency has raised again the question, Adam, where you at?
But worst of all, worse than all of that, is that God is asking the question. Adam, where are you? Now, if God can't find Adam, then you shouldn't be shocked. We can't find him either. Adam, where are you? Now, God is omniscient. He knows all. God is omnipresent. He exists everywhere simultaneously. So God's question about where Adam was was not fundamentally a question of location. He knows where Adam is located. He's the one in the garden with him. So the question that I am raising that God raises with the first Adam and the Hebrew word for Adam means earth. For he was created from the earth. The woman was not created from the earth. She was created from Adam. Now that's a deeper point that we'll get to later. But Adam is earth and God says, where are you? No, let me tell you what was at the heart of the question. At the heart of the question, where are you, was not fundamentally a question of location. It was a question of position. See, Adam had abandoned his role. He had abandoned his calling. He had abandoned his position. So the question of where are you is a question of positioning. Ezekiel chapter 22 verse 30, God says, I was looking for a man to stand in the gap so I would not have to curse the land, but I could find none. There were plenty of males, but he said, I can't find a man. So apparently you can be a male and not be a man. And he says, because I couldn't find a man, I had to curse the land. So a land becomes cursed when men cannot be located, even when males are everywhere. Adam had abandoned his position. And so the desperate need of today is to call males back to being men. As God defines a man. Not as the culture defines it. And so I want to speak with you about answering the question about the position of a man. Adam, where are you? Now, ladies, there are going to be two reactions to what I say today. Some of you will be frustrated because you will be thinking, oh, here we go with this man thing. Others of you will be ecstatic because the man in your life or the one you hope comes along.
Oh, <laughs> 